Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome our distinguished guest, Professor A.K. Singh, Dr. Santosh Narona, and our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Parimal Vyas. I also welcome all directors, faculty deans, heads of the department, faculty members, and all those who have joined this webinar. The new education policy gives a long-term concept with far-reaching influence and is definitely going to change future challenges into opportunities by improving the education system. This will in turn strengthen the culture of innovation, institution, and inclusion. The adoption of the new education policy is mainly based on the intention to pave the way for transformational reforms from school to higher education systems, thereby making India a global knowledge superpower. On the occasion of completing one year of National Education Policy 2020, the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda is privileged to have this webinar titled Use of Technology in Education, which has been jointly organized by the Computer Center and Internal Quality Assurance Cell of the University. I would now request Dr. Arun Pratap sir, Arun Anand sir, to play the university song. I request all the invitees to please rise for the university song. I would now request Professor Apurva Shah, Director, Computer Center, to officially welcome everyone and address the gathering. Apurva Sir. Sir, your, uh, your mic is unmuted. Signatories of uh, today's function, 
Chief Guest Professor A.K. Singh, Vice Chancellor of Sri Sri University, Katak, Odisha, and Guest of Honor, Dr. Santosh Naroha, our, our own Vice Chancellor, Professor Parimal Vyas, Rajit Charsal, Deans and Directors of the University, Dr. B.S. Chakravarti, Director IQSC, Senate and Syndicate members, as well as students and staff of the university. I take opportunity to welcome Professor A.K. Singh, Vice Chancellor of Sri Sri University, and Dr. Santosh Naroha from IIT Bombay at the Maharaja Sahaja University of Baroda. New education policy has focused on many different dimensions of education, role of policymakers to different stakeholders. So, a lot of the things has been focused by new education policy. And Maharaja Sahaja Rao University of Baroda is also celebrating one year of NET 2020. Today's topic is use of technology in education. That is one of the most important among the different, uh, different perspectives focused by NET 2020. During pandemic situation, since last one and a half year, all of we are encouraged, rather forced, to adopt the new technologies like online classes, online exams, online PhD viva awards. Okay. And I'm sure all of you have faced new and unexpected challenges in education system. So in whatever role we have played as a student, as a teacher, or as an administrator. In this era, probably we came to know about the power of technology until before 18 months when NEP 2020 was also not arrived, as well as this pandemic situation was also not there. The ICT, that means the use of PowerPoint. That was what primary meaning majority of the people were believing. Okay. Uh, but along with PPTs, use of video conferencing system, use of graphic tablet, use of learning management system, that is LMS, requirement of online examination system. This is, we are talking about teaching, learning, and evaluation tools. Along with that, technology is helpful in governance also. Okay. So, NEP 2020 is guiding from all this, that means as a, uh, as a whole from all this direction. Today we are getting opportunity to hear Professor A.K. Singh and Dr. Santosh Naroha on the subject of use of technology in education. Okay. I'm sure all of you shall get a new insight of this topic uh, today after attending this seminar. So I welcome both the speakers and I, uh, also, thank uh, MS University of Baroda, especially Professor Parimal Vyas, Vice Chancellor, sir, for motivating us to think in this direction. So, thank you all of you. Over to you, Hetal Madam. Thank you, sir. Hmm. I would now request Dr. Nitin Bhate, Head, Department of Chemical Engineering, Faculty of Technology and Engineering, to give an introduction about our guest of honor, Dr. Santosh Narona. Over to you, Bhate, sir. Uh, a very good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it is my uh, you know honor and privilege to uh, introduce Prof Professor uh, uh, Santosh Norona. Uh, Professor Norona obtained his B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from uh, IIT Madras and subsequently a PhD in Biochemical Engineering. He was then employed as a postdoctoral fellow for several years at NIH Bethesda, and he has been with IIT Bombay since uh, the year 2001. He is a biochemical engineer by profession and by training who has evolved multidisciplinary interests. He has focused on understanding various metabolic and regulatory aspects of microbial systems towards rationally manipulating their productivity using genetic engineering techniques for production of therapeutics. And among other activities, he has focused on reactor optimization strategies for bioprocesses and on developing algorithms for online adaptive control. This has resulted in an open source, indigenously developed bioreactor platform. This focus on indigenous instrumentation has extended into the creation of low cost virtual laboratory rigs as well as healthcare devices probably this has motivated him to you know take up uh, 
the role of uh, you know uh, coordinator of virtual labs so he coordinates development and deployment of uh, virtual labs uh, uh, which is an mhrd ict uh, project he is also professor in charge of the tata center for technology and design an interdisciplinary center uh, which has been set up in iit bombay with a focus on creating solutions with a high social impact and he is also coordinator of healthcare research consortium at iit bombay which interfaces with major hospitals and research labs in the uh, mumbai area and is now active actively engaged in translating several collaborative research efforts into technologies uh, uh, well uh, with this uh, uh, brief introduction of professor noruna i uh, formally uh, you know invite him to deliver his talk on the behalf of the maharaja sayaji university of baroda uh, over to you uh, uh, professor noruna thank you all uh, thank you professor bate for that not so brief introduction uh, let me start sharing my slides on the concept of virtual labs which is a demonstration of technology that we hope to use at large scales to supplement uh, the in class theory, theory teaching uh, hopefully you're able to see the slides and hear me fine yeah so Yes, sir. The slides are visible, sir. Yeah, thank you. So this question of um, virtual labs actually forces us to address a fundamental question: Why do you even need a lab uh, in an engineering context? And in some ways, you can extend this to non-engineering disciplines as well. And uh, to set the framework for uh, the discussion of technology and the use of technology, I, I want to first point out that at best we achieve two things in uh, teaching via a lab: we either reinform Okay, reaffirm and uh, reinforce a theoretical concept, and you do so in in, in an interactive fashion. Uh, or else, the objective is to make uh, students familiar with real world hardware, so that they they are familiar with certain uh, technologies and uh, gadgets in particular as they transition into the industrial workplace. Okay, if you stop to think of how the undergraduate labs, in particular, in the various engineering uh, systems have evolved over the last uh, decades. Uh, unfortunately we have activities on uh, most afternoons which are devoted primarily towards uh, generating small amounts of data tediously over large periods of time typically a 3 hour lab session and arguably very little learning actually occurs and a bigger problem is the fact that uh, typically labs are taught uh, asynchronously in the sense that you would normally uh, undertake the learning of a particular theoretical concept in a given semester and then come to the corresponding lab in a subsequent semester so the questions we have asked ourselves uh, over time both at iit bombay and as part of a larger challenge posed to us by mhrd is how do you upgrade the state of lab education and bring into it a, a kind of interactivity but also a kind of timeliness as to how this benefits a student and reinforces whatever theory they learn and so uh, i'm going to tell you about uh, the Uh, origins of a program funded by MHRD called Virtual Labs. This is the counterpart of NPTEL, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. NPTEL focuses on the delivery of uh, theory lectures, and in an attempt to make uh, this more interactive as a framework, uh, Virtual Labs uh, was created as a standalone program. But steadily now, we are starting to merge our activities into what's called a MOOC. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the notion uh, of an online course, which allows for uh brief pieces of theory to be taught and then uh, followed up by interactive uh, engagement with students uh if you look at pedagogy and uh, iit bombay has uh, over time put together a center for education technology trying to understand the importance and choices of technologies which are appropriate for large scale engineering education if you look at this uh, the, the classification of learning objectives that people uh, have to achieve can be done at uh, multiple layers of uh, difficulty at multiple levels of difficulty and where you really want to be after uh, students go through an educational program is at the top where their thinking and learning of a concept is so evolved that they are able to create their own hypothesis and design protocols to test them experimental protocols to test their own hypothesis unfortunately for us most of our teaching is aimed at the lower levels where you're just getting people to remember and 
maybe at best uh, understand concepts, but you'll find that most students uh, struggle when it comes to applying these concepts on standalone uh, novel problems and um, in analyzing uh, unusual or new situations. Uh, so the point of it is therefore a good lab ultimately is something which allows people to achieve the top levels, the creation and evaluation uh, uh, aspects of learning. And the ideal lab experiment we have come to understand is something where the student team is given a concept and is actually shown then a storeroom full of components and is required to put together their own device or uh, experimental rig, then generate their own data and uh, comment on whether this data confirms or, or uh, disagrees with the published theory. And then finally, they're expected to put away the apparatus and uh, uh, store the setup away. This, of course, is next to impossible uh, in, in the Indian context, particularly given the cost involved with allowing the people one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention on, on experimental apparatus. And that's been the origin uh, of a major problem, which is we are nowhere close to an ideal experiment, which may happen in a few Western universities at best, in our undergraduate programs at least, but doesn't happen world, the world over, which implies that if you want to achieve this level of uh, understanding where people are able to put together their own designs for experiments, you've got to do it. If you can't do it with hardware, you've got to do it with simulators. Okay. And so therefore, uh, 10 years ago, uh, when MHRD required that we try to get together um, uh, as a bunch of uh, engineering uh, experts and put together a program on virtual labs and understand steadily how this might be adopted, uh, uh, they funded, it funded through uh, the enemy ICT scheme, uh, a program on virtual labs, which currently uh, uh, you can access for free at vlab.co.in. And it got a bunch of partners uh, there were 11 of them at the outset who came together to create content. Uh, so the expectation early on was that the IITs would find a way to map their undergraduate lab content into ways uh, which others could use, especially the, the second and third tier colleges in small towns, uh, which probably had no lab infrastructure at all. Uh, and, and for the most part, therefore, the effort early on was to ask the question, could we do two things? One just convert our physical lab experiments into simulator counterparts, just imitate what's going on in the physical lab using simulators. And second, find a way to keep some of the hardware that we have, that we use for our undergraduate labs, find a way to keep that hardware online so that kids elsewhere would be able to log in to the internet and control the hardware and run experiments. So, so in other words, was there a way to use hardware 24 seven? Okay, so that experiments could be done even in the middle of the night if uh, needed. So we've been, since the outset of this, been uh, as a collective group of uh, enthusiasts and uh, stakeholders in the lab ecosystems, we've been experimenting with ways of getting this done. Uh, the broad idea, therefore, is that a physical lab or a simulator uh, is remotely accessed and uh, ideally is accessed simultaneously by multiple users. Uh, so that, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, in a, in a economic sense, there is a much uh, greater uh, use for the investment uh, that, that finally all of this requires. Um, uh, if uh, I were to try to characterize uh, how this uh, uh, has evolved over the years, uh, there are basically three categories of labs which have been experimented with, which are potentially uh, um, uh, ultimately all uh, useful in their own way. One is the outright simulation uh, of a set of concepts. Uh, these simulations in particular are easily to do, easy to do in, uh, for example, electrical engineering or electronics with lots of simulators, which are, which are, for example, capable of designing circuits for you and evaluating your circuit designs and so on. A little harder to do in disciplines like civil engineering or chemical engineering and so on, because even though simulators do exist, these are not necessarily open source and free to use. A second approach which uh, has been used, and in fact, IIT Bombay has been using this through the pandemic, is to use our hardware to generate data sets. So we've, um, throughout the pandemic, uh, had some of our staff members run the hardware and generated distinct data sets, simulating the process where real data is generated. And then this data is fed to the students. Uh, of course, expected to go through the rest of the analysis process and then uh, demonstrate their learning of concepts. So this uh, has the advantage that it brings in a real world uh, 
uh, element because this is real data as opposed to simulated data and real data has always its issues. For example, sensors may not work perfectly and so on. And for the student to therefore interpret their results uh, carefully, trying to understand whether any theoretical concept is indeed validated or potentially uh, that uh, the errors are too large to, to defend uh, uh, a particular theoretical claim. The last approach which we have tried uh, is uh, where we've looked to remote trigger hardware uh, uh, through the net. And uh, uh, to be honest, this has not worked too well. And the reason for that, as you can imagine, is that if the network access is not guaranteed, you're going to have issues with uh, starting up an experiment uh, uh, at a distance across the net and then getting disconnected, which uh, basically implies that you, you essentially get forced into resetting the whole exper experiment. The other problem with remote triggering is essentially only one student gets to control an apparatus at a time. And therefore you're back to the situation where a large batch of students in a lab experiment um, uh, come together at a particular rig, but only one of them is controlling. Therefore only one of them is in a hands-on sense learning. The others are just watching. So uh, we, we kind of therefore started diverting uh, most of our resources on the modeling and simulation front because we realized very quickly that uh, when it comes to scaling the impact of virtual labs that we were probably going to benefit most by generating a large number of simulators and, uh, and uh, delivering a bunch of concepts through that modality. And effectively uh, methods two and three, the measurement labs and the remote regard labs are things that we continue to work on, but we believe that not every concept deserves to be taught through hardware directly. Uh, just to give you a sense of uh, how these things uh, look and feel, um, I'm giving you screenshots of three different experiments. On the top left, you have a, a reactor being uh, controlled. So essentially, uh, these are control experiments, uh, pH control of, of, a, of a bioprocess. And, and you're actually teaching people uh, various uh, concepts in process control. To the right, you're seeing an experiment uh, in fluid mechanics, uh, where uh, people are learning the basics of uh, fluid flow, uh, uh, as would be taught in a transport phenomena course. On the bottom left, you're actually looking at an experiment uh, developed in the microbiology domain, proving the point that it's not only engineering experiments which can be simulated and which can be taught. So you've had increasingly people crossing over from the life sciences wanting to figure out if they can leverage this to achieve some level of interactive learning through uh, simulators. Uh, to give you a sense of how these lo look and feel, uh, to pick up a chemical engineering lab, for example, of uh, a fluid mechanics lab, you'll realize uh, when you look at the panel on the left that these are similar things to what happens in a physical lab. There's the uh, objective of the experiment. You wish for a pretest to make sure people are uh, aware of the basic uh, uh, concepts that they're supposed to have uh, understood through the theory lectures uh, previously. Then, of course, there's the simulator itself. Uh, and details on what they do with the simulator in terms of protocol. And then the necessity to look at uh, whether they have now understood concepts through a post-test mechanism. So where normally one would have been taking VIVAs through either an instructor or, or a teaching assistant, now the evaluation process shifts online. And importantly, uh, the, the, there is the ability to ask further, uh, uh, to provide further detail in terms of further reading material so that people can go in and look up more advanced uh, reading. And so in that sense, the learning continues. Uh, ju just various screenshots of how these things are obtained. You'll realize that these are very simplistic interfaces where there's no complexity to the simulator. So basically there's a whole range of therefore uh, things which range from at one extreme, something like a flight simulator, which is very realistic to the other extreme, just simple forms and interfaces and sliders. For example, in this fluid mechanics experiment, uh, after having read this kind of theory and being forced into choosing some set points, people just move a slider, which simulates moving a valve to a particular set point, right? And then that's enough to convey the concept and forces the interactive element where a student has to do some calculations to figure out what to do. Uh, and, and at this point, uh, they essentially, you simulate what would have happened in the real world, which is having a, um, opened a valve to a particular level, you now wait for a beaker to fill up with water uh, and your timing. So this is simulating aspects where they would have been sitting around with a literally a timer and maybe a beaker or a bucket. Um, you measure pressure drops and uh, there's a simplistic uh, series of uh, animations which allow for uh, the simulation of manometers uh, where you achieve different pressure drops and so on. And so when you look at uh, how students react to even simple 
interfaces like this via simulators, which are custom created. By the way, everything was done using open source uh, platforms. Uh, students find them to be extremely motivational, and that's not a big surprise. People would prefer to sit in front of computers and learn for the most part, rather than physically be at uh, some rig. Uh, but importantly, people uh, we have realized end up learning uh, on their own. Okay, and, and therefore, uh, because they're learning on their own, uh, there, there's a certain quality to their learning, which is uh, excellent. Uh, what you also realize is people learn at their own pace. So where otherwise the lab uh, experiment uh, happens at a, a, a uniform pace. So everybody in a group is expected to learn at the same pace, let's say in a three hour lab. Here, the individuals learn at their own speed and ultimately evaluate themselves as and when they're ready for evaluation. So it's turned out to be uh, something which people therefore uh, don't find oppressing and therefore prefer to do. And from an instructor's perspective, um, this ends up being integrated, um, uh, as uh, Professor Shah pointed out, uh, into a learning management system, uh, and therefore gets formally integrated into the curriculum and becomes a much more efficient and useful teaching aid. And in fact, so much so that at IIT Bombay, we have been investing in developing our own learning management systems and customizing this because where we are starting to go is literally a little bit of theory followed by an interactive simulator followed by uh, another bit of theory, and that's how our lack the lectures are converting into interactive lectures in real time. Uh, and something that we have realized uh, has happened here is as students and teachers start trying to look at concepts through this interactive methodology, uh, the learning associated with the topic has actually increased greatly. And to give you an idea of why, so for example, the fluid mechanics experiment which we simulated, which actually takes a, an undergraduate team of four students three hours to do. In a simulator, they do it in uh, five minutes flat. Because the whole thing is obviously computationally automated and numbers are being generated and given to the students. There's no waiting around. And therefore, our challenge flips into how do you keep a team of students active for at least a 15 minute online session, if it's supposed to be a lab session. And the only way you do it is by increasing, increasing the complexity of the whole uh, engagement. So you're forced to teach not one concept, but multiple concepts. And that requires you to learn more. So what if, for example, that meter breaks down, then what might happen to your data uh, and so on. So in an interactive sense, uh, we look at uh, ways of getting this uh, going. Uh, the Virtual Labs program has uh, gone through multiple stages uh, uh, in, in its annual uh, rollout. It's, it's literally at the end of its third phase. We are about to start a fourth phase. A lot of content has been developed. Uh, what has happened over time is we have realized that this cannot be done by uh, 11 institutes alone. And effectively, we have created a structure where there are, there are nodal centers and regional centers. So nodal center starts rolling out content. And as they start becoming very familiar with the modality, some of them are elevated into being regional centers. MS Paroda is a regional center. Uh, and uh, increasingly, therefore, uh, a large number of uh, people start uh, connecting via uh, such a regional center and nodal center platforms and very large usages are achieved. Uh, uh, to give you up-to-date counts, uh, we're we looking at IIT Bombay now interacting with 300 nodal centers in the Western region and 12 lakh uses of these experiments that are currently developed already. So it's a very large number. Uh, and, and if you look at the overall national count, without a doubt, the Western region uh, has been the most uh, productive in terms of enthusiasm for this method for instruction. But something that's evolved over time is we have realized that uh, content cannot be developed uh, at the 11 institutes alone. And that content actually has to come from the nodal centers who are responsible ultimately for teaching their own students. And in that sense, we have flipped this problem of how to create content into one of how do we get nodal centers and regional centers to create their own content. And we have initially tried to uh, uh, set uh, uh, the best practices up through a protocol of boot camps and workshops where faculty student teams, uh, almost like a hackathon, have come together and tried to create large amounts of content. And some of these, uh, in terms of getting them polished, finally the student teams come to IIT Bombay and spend some time there uh, trying to remove all the bugs from the simulated uh, uh, concepts. Uh, for which uh, we went over and above what MHRD asked us to do and created a portal for the community itself. So this is now shifting from being something like NPTEL, which is centrally provided, to now being a community driven effort where uh, we have VLAB step, where a community of nodal centers have come together and identified best practices. Uh, and therefore, it's uh, people uh, uh, 
like you in the audience today who are creating content for themselves. Uh, and ultimately that's because um, there are syllabus gaps, especially in the non electrical and computer science disciplines, which have to be filled in by uh, uh, the set of faculty or teaching courses. And for example, in IIT Bombay, we don't teach several courses which you find in universities. So there's no way we'll ever create content for those. So uh, therefore this emphasis on shifting into content creation through the nodal centers. Um, we started looking at this uh, as, as an approach in 2016 and uh, we've reached a point where a large number of uh, uh, experiments have already been developed in the trial mode. And these are now improving in quality to the point we feel they can merge back into the national pool. So content created by local colleges is merging back onto a national platform and that's bringing visibility to the content developers. It's bringing a national level visibility. By the way, uh, there's international visibility for virtual labs. We've had during the pandemic, uh, Chinese uh, universities, we've had the universities in the UK uh, uh, and Spain look to use our, our content. So clearly uh, when the pandemic hit and physical labs could not occur, the need for simulated content to be used turned out to be very acute. And it's turned out to be something that uh, we've been able to handle uh, to some extent. These are uh, examples of uh, boot camps and workshops. You'll recognize Nitin Bate in the center there. Uh, one held at uh, Paroda, this was probably in 2017. Uh, and then uh, every year we have gone out and held uh, large boot camps uh, aiming to encourage people to create content. So these are combinations of faculty student teams, usually a faculty member from a core discipline and students from their discipline, but also students from an IT department to help with the programming. And collectively they put together uh, a virtual uh, lab experiment. Uh, so a lot of it has been about how to manage teams and create uh, uh, a sustainable way of uh, getting content done. And by the way, because software becomes obsolete all the time, how do you end up uh, having a mechanism by which you maintain content uh, and, uh, and update it, and for that matter, improve on it over time? Uh, uh, during the lockdown, and I'm just skipping through slides uh, for lack of time, but we have essentially held several bootathons and uh, in the process, we have uh, fine-tuned our content and, and the protocols for how to not just create a concept, create a virtual lab experiment, but also to make sure it is polished such that we can host it and do so in a very short window of time. Uh, so we've started uh, essentially putting together uh, webinars on how to uh, create content and so that people come into a hackathon mode well-prepared. So in other words, this is almost like coaching of teams before they get into a, pro a productive hackathon uh, phase where they actually create the content. And during uh, the lockdown, when any, anyway, people were captive and had to connect to the net, we spent a lot of time uh, pushing for content creation and managed to get 40 experiments uh, developed. Um, uh, MS Baroda has contributed a, a, a whole lab in heat transfer. Uh, you saw some of the simulations there. And, and in fact, um, this is an uh, example of an experiment uh, created by Nitin Bate, where he's uh, mapping the hardware experiment as it physically exists in the chemical engineering department at MSU to a simulation. And he's worked out the appropriate uh, questions to be asked of it, both from uh, an interactive perspective, but also pedagogy and best practices ultimately set up. Okay, in terms of artwork. So uh, as you can imagine, uh, students are forced to make different choices, create data tables, uh, they're forced to compute certain things uh, from whatever process data that they collected. And ultimately they are evaluated online. And in fact, the data is plotted online and a, a lab report is itself generated online as a PDF. So the whole experiment, a lot of the drudgery in the whole process is taken out and the focus is now primarily on the learning uh, of this particular concept. So where, where is this program going? Um, the, one of the things that the pandemic has done is we've realized a lot of uh, the kids out there are actually forced into accessing virtual labs through phones. And we had initially developed these for access through browsers on laptops or desktops. Uh, so we are in a phase where we are trying to redo some of the artwork such that it's compatible and the interfaces such that it's compatible with phones. We're looking at, uh, rather than thinking of theory and labs as separate aspects. We're thinking of using the technology of virtual labs directly in a theory course. And a couple of uh, theory courses at IIT Bombay, especially in the controls domain, have occurred like this, where uh, a little bit of theory is taught and people are forced to immediately demonstrate their understanding of their theory by going and doing the online simulated experiment straight up. So not waiting to the next semester. 
Uh, so essentially, the tutorials are now turning into lab sessions. Uh, we are starting to see that uh, universities are adopting virtual labs and actually integrating it in the curriculum. In fact, Pune University has, in fact, gone one step ahead and is offering credits to student faculty teams. So students get credits if they can actually create uh, virtual labs in a supervised learning course kind of mode. Uh, the ministry has put pressure on us to go beyond the engineering colleges to now cater to polytechnics. And uh, so we're looking at now converting our processes into things which uh, can be undertaken by instructors in the polytechnics. And uh, in terms of uh, technologies themselves, there's no end to this. Uh, newer technologies keep coming in. For example, the need to do this in automated fashion requires that you correctly authenticate a student because you later on may be interested in awarding marks or certifying that somebody did an experiment. Uh, we need to make sure that no two students see the same experience. So can you randomize the experiments enough so, so that, uh, for example, you cut down on the incidence of cheating? Can students actually pause an experiment, come back later and resume it, which is a very interesting concept, uh, which you cannot do with real hardware, but you can do that with simulators. And uh, increasingly, can you take advantage of augmented reality and virtual reality to give them a much better uh, and realistic feel for this? Now, that obviously is computationally intensive, but ultimately, like with flight simulators or surgical simulators, that's where it will go. And uh, it's not always about technology. It's also about uh, pedagogy. And so uh, we've been abstracting out in, in our attempt to create and upgrade the content that we have. What are the best practices of teaching lab experiments and creating frameworks so that others can come in and start creating storyboards around their theoretical concepts and therefore take a first step towards creating virtual labs. And in the long term, I see that uh, the labs get personalized to the point uh, software is automated and will detect whether somebody is moving down the right track of completing an experiment or else they are not understanding the concept and therefore are aimlessly going back and forth. And in that process, you, the software will start throwing up hints, almost like a game as to what to do next. And that's how essentially personal, personalization in lab learning is going to arrive. So all of these are being experimented upon at various early stages of implementation, but you're going to see the nature of a lab is experiment change dramatically over the next five years. Um, so when you look at the long-term goals and benefits, the rollout, of course, uh, we are seeing a much greater adoption of uh, high quality content. And there's a uniformity therefore across, especially the, as I said, the second and third tier colleges, which are now getting to access uh, high quality content. Um, this is the creation of new content, as I said, but at the end of the day, um, a student should still understand hardware. And so we are now also uh, in, in a very small sense, trying to ask, are there low cost elements uh, of hardware which can be built, which can address multiple concepts and therefore make, can we therefore make these cost effective? Uh, and can these be done at a university level? There's no way the ministry centrally can finance all of this for everybody, but these may be executed at, at individual universities uh, towards ultimately catering to their own colleges. And we find that getting people to step through these layers of understanding simulations, building their own lab hardware, uh, ultimately motivates them to get into the innovation game. And you see an example of that at IIT Bombay, where students have gone through this process, have actually gone on to create startups uh, on uh, innovation in especially uh, electronic devices. Uh, so there's a real reason why we should think of changing the way labs are dealt with. And rather than looking at it as a chore to complete, can we get students to understand that there's a pipeline which allows them to actually get their hands trained so that they can get into more innovative aspects of uh, 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 learning. So uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and I should thank a few people. I thank the Vice Chancellor of uh, MSU, Professor Vyas, for uh, giving me an opportunity to come in and talk about virtual labs. And I also thank uh, Professor Shah and Chakravarti, who've uh, uh, been uh, uh, organizing this event and therefore for having me here. And I also thank Professor Nitin Bhatte, who served as uh, uh, the regional uh, uh, coordinator for virtual labs at MS Paroda. And what we hope to do as a consequence of uh, widening our engagement uh, with you folks is uh, we hope to attract a larger number of people uh, to come into this aspect of creating content, uh, both in terms of uh, the technologies relevant, but especially the pedagogy of, of what goes on. And we look forward to a larger engagement with MS Paroda uh, for the longer term. So let me stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for your informative and valuable inputs related to using virtual labs in the context with the NEP and how it can be a part of MOOCs and how actually it will be helpful in this pandemic environment. Thank you, sir.
I would now request Professor Apurva Sa to give an introduction about our chief guest, Professor A K Singh. Over to you, Apurva Sa. Thank you, Vital uh, Madam, to give me opportunity to introduce the chief guest of today's function, Professor A K Singh. Uh, Professor Ajay Kumar Singh is Vice Chancellor of Sri Sri University, Kutuk, Odisha. Which aside from May 10, 2019, Dr. Singh is fellow and managing trustee of Indian Commerce Association. He is also immediate past president of Indian Commerce Association Delhi (NCR) chapter, past president of Indian Association for Management and Development, fellow of Computer Society of India, honorary president of governing body of Divine Group of Institutions. DSPSR and many other NGOs. Dr. Singh, a school topper, SRCC alumnus, editor in chief of Delhi Business Review, he has also earned Best Teacher Award for two consecutive years in 1998 and 1999 from IAMC. Twelve international awards and distinguished have been conferred upon him, including two gold medals, one silver medal, and other notable distinctions. 35 scholars have been awarded PhD degree under his supervision. Dr. Singh was he was conferred by Indian Commerce Association (IICA) for the best business academic uh, academic of the year award 2011 and MSMM Research Award 2011 and 2012. Dr. Singh has 33 plus years of teaching experience in all with 211 uh, publications, including 10 books. One international monograph, one zero six research papers, and twelve articles, sixteen case studies, and fifty four editorial reviews. Dr. Singh has served as vice chancellor of University of Jazeera, Dubai. He has also travelled to twenty three countries and addressed in more than two hundred conferences, seminars, and workshops. Uh, in more than hundred online sessions and webinars in just last four months, he is an EOL. He is on EOL. From the post of professor at Faculty of Commerce uh, at Delhi School of Business, uh, Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi, he has served as dean work at Delhi University, OSD University Press at Delhi University, and head Graphic Art Center, University of Delhi. I welcome you, sir, again at MS University of Baroda, and request you to share your thoughts about the today uh, about today's topic. Uh, over to you, Ek uh, Singh sir. Thank you very much, Professor Purusha, for the generous introduction, Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, the Maharaja Sahaj Rao University of Baroda, Professor Parimal H. Vyas ji, other distinguished uh, colleagues, and the speaker who just spoke about the virtual labs, Dr. Santosh ji from IIT Bombay, uh, the. Uh, Dr. Hetal Bhavsar ji from Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and Dr. Arun Anand ji from Department of Applied Physics, uh, Professor Kamlesh Vaishnav ji from Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and Dr. B. S. Chakravarti ji, Director IQAC, all other distinguished guests, friends, invitees, participants. Good evening to all of you. Namaste. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be with Professor Parimal H. Vyas ji. He is very dear, like a brother to me. And any any platform where we can be together is a matter of delight for us, for me particularly. And the topic of today that has been assigned is uh, really uh, something which is the need of the hour. i must congratulate the entire team for choosing this particular topic i'm just sharing my screen and let me know if you can see this use of technology in education yes 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 very much is something that became so important in march 2020 when the government of india and in our state it was even before that it was announced that uh, it is uh, you know uh, going to be the disaster management act being implemented and uh, you you can't run 
you know, face to face classes and all that. So immediately we decided that we have to fall back upon technology and uh, uh, we, we trained our teachers uh, on the same evening and we decided that uh, we will from Monday, it was Friday, uh, actually when this was announced in Odisha by the Honorable Chief Minister in the Assembly. And we decided that from Monday, we will have online classes. Fortunately, we were using uh, the Zoom and we had Google Suite account and all that. So it was easy for us at that time to uh, quickly train people for classes uh, to be conducted online. And then we decided that uh, this is something which we can't ignore. And uh, we found that now the UGC has come out with a, you know, a regulation kind of a thing you can say, which says that uh, uh, blended learning and all those aspects have been uh, shared by them. Uh, and uh, it is the need of the hour now more profoundly the flipped classroom is being talked about and things like that so uh, technology is something which is from different aspects uh, so the agenda for me today is industry 4.0 education 4.0 even 5.0 trends in digital transformation and education journey towards MOOCs in india because i was associated with epg Parshala when Ministry of HRD at that time gave this project to the University of Delhi. So I was associated with that, then LMS and then IPSIT. So technology can deliver new educational opportunities for everyone. It offers huge opportunities to transform global education at all age levels. Technology continues to develop at a rapid pace and access to technologies such as mobile phones and the internet is growing at a very fast pace. A recent report by KPMG tracks the number of EdTech users at 9.6 million and the market share of the EdTech sector in India at $1.96 billion. A lot of startups are getting a lot of funding nowadays. Those who are related to EdTech, you can see in the news. And uh, these whopping figures convey the story of transformation this sector has undergone in recent years, not to mention the acceleration caused by COVID-19, as I specified earlier. Education, as we know it, has undergone a sea of changes and its dynamics are changing every single day. And one of the reasons is Industry 4.0. The fourth industrial revolution makes three major changes, namely intellectualization of human and machine, virtualization, as was mentioned by the previous speaker of the real and virtual and hyper connection of human and things. This revolution brings about changes in future society due to technological progress. If we see the phases of industrialization, in 1780s, when the machinery was you know, the something, factory was considered to be something, if you have, then you are a great person. And then in the 1900s, industry 2.0, the electricity came into being. Then in 1970s, the computers came into being. The number of years it took, you can see at the bottom of the slide, 120 years, 70 years, 30 years, and 20 years now. And now we are moving towards industry 5.0, internet came now, and there are other aspects as we are seeing, which is happening. So as far as the educational innovation in the fourth industrial revolution era is concerned, these changes have accelerated many things and unique skill sets of human capital have been required by the new economy and the new normal. The important factor in the future intelligent information society is to cultivate human tech literary literacy resources. So if you see this diagram, it's about cultivate human tech literacy resources in the fourth industrial revolution era. So the context intelligence is something which has become important, emotional intelligence.
all these are different aspects uh, cognitive emotional physical social if you see are the real things which are uh, important to be considered in this domain to be able to cultivate human tech literacy resources in the future intelligent information society new and creative fusion talents are required these creative fusion talents should have the following four intelligences as i mentioned to you context intelligence emotional intelligence social and emotional intelligence and physical intelligence and uh, as you see the technology coming into as i mentioned to you about flipped classroom smart learning so this is all about mobile learning oriented uh, scenario that has come up collaborative learning hybrid learning social learning emotional measuring learning uh, phenomenon learning so all these are important even at the early ages of life as well so education 4.0 the current initiative and leadership based learning objectives introduced by education 4.0 have made the transformation obligate from traditional classroom of the industrial society to creation of digital classroom that is why these kind of initiatives are very important i congratulate professor parimal h bias ji for thinking about such initiatives and implementing them education 4.0 puts the learners at the center of the ecosystem and empowers them to structure their learning paths in alignment with the final outcome it is a personalization of the learning process where the learner has complete flexibility to become the architect of his or her own learning paths and has the freedom to aspire for approach and achieve personal goals by choice so aspiration of each individual needs to be taken care of that is very very important so uh, flexibility and quality when we say you can pick teachers you can pick timings frame your courses now we have academic bank of credits which has been promulgated actually the notification has come gazette notification has come about academic bank of credits so this has become a reality now that you can frame you know you can design your degree a student uh, can you know it makes it student centric approach as per the new national education policy which focuses on this aspect an academic bank of credit is an instrument for making it student centric they can you know take credits from different universities 10 universities or whatever number of universities they want to and then ask for a university to give a degree which as per that abc is bachelor of uh, educational learning something like that is the name of that degree which is a new coined degree and uh, uh, if he wants a degree which is your regular degree then 30 to 50% as per the choice of the institution you he has to do uh, courses from that program so uh, there is uh, full flexibility also there is flexibility uh, given to the institution also that you can have minimum of 30 to 50% of the credits from that program that you say that is a must if you want to get mba degree say for example or any other degree student through any mode so it's like a real world now and uh, when ready you can learn or exams on demand like cpa exam of us you can actually book your seat for the examination in the center on the day that you want to at the time that you want to so it's like examination on demand so you can be evaluated the day and time that you want to so individual goals and how why where when what these are the aspects which are important uh, that could be answered through this journey uh, and uh, education 4.0 is about providing answers to all of them variety of education programs options of instructional approaches as was mentioned virtual labs in the previous session academic support strategies learning experiences i'm not going to details of all of them uh, the time is less so student experience is one dimension that a student is at the center hcis are focusing on enriching the student experience and then research excellence is also which is to be taken care of and uh, iits have shown the lead in that that was evident from the previous presentation society uh, with education 4.0 introducing a revamp model for university education 
to eliminate the constraints of location and rigid program structure, it is crucial for the broader society to fully accept this new wave and acknowledge the validity of, of remote and flexible university degrees. So this is going to be the reality now. We can't do away with that for long. It is already in front of us. Employability is something which needs to be taken care of. So the courses are to be such that you are making people industry ready. Uh, curriculum should be based on learning outcome based curriculum framework. I was member of a committee of University Grants Commission where we designed BCom honors and BCom curriculum, which was uh, experience and learning based. Every course in that program has been you know, designed in a manner that there are learning outcomes, how a teacher would ensure that the learning outcomes happen in the previous presentation, Bloom's taxonomy was being specified in that in the different stages of that, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, create. So all those levels are to be made sure that people are able to achieve them. And, uh, and there are practical exercises which needs to be conducted to ensure that those outcomes are really on the ground. So uh, you can see it's on the website of University Grants Commission uh, available for all of you and make sure that and the curriculum of the future is based on the fact that uh, every uh, unit uh, or every module should have some outcome for the students because now uh, he can have only say four credits, three credits from you. So depending on whatever course he wants to do it from you, every course in, independently should be employable. It should enhance the skills in a manner that whatever industry 4.0, 5.0 requires, he is able to do that. So what are the uh, trends now? Internet of things, augmented reality, cybersecurity, personalized learning, artificial intelligence, and big data. And education 5.0 is the next step. So we are on the doorstep of that. So future focus graduates with a global mindset. Innovative delivery, inspiring educators, transformative learning environment, meaningful learning experience, organic relevant curriculum. All these are you know, important for nurturing thinking learners who are agents of their own learning. The time is not that what you will study, you will implement. The time is when you will go to the market when uh, the real life will show up to you, uh, you will find that the newer things, what you studied has become obsolete. Ability to learn, learning to learn, lifelong learning. These are the you know buzzwords now. So uh, meaningful learning experience is important so that you, you don't uh, go you know out of frame when something shows up to you, which you have never seen. This COVID-19 is one such example the world encountered with which never happened in the history of mankind, this kind of experience actually. So learning at a global platform, learning in the community, learning at the workplace, learning online like Bloom's tax, you know, uh, um, taxonomy use, MOOCs, uh, blended learning, learning from the experts, learning with and from peers. So all these are you know important for creating a meaningful learning experience for the learners. Uh, so far as journey towards MOOCs in India is concerned, IITs have uh, taken the lead in that. And we in University of Delhi were part of uh, EPG Partshala. I was part of like these co courses, management concepts and organization behavior. You can see my name here as paper coordinator for this. This was for MCOM that we did. And uh, Professor K.V. Bhanamurthy ji was the principal investigator for the MCOM program. And this center actually was one of the best uh, as mentioned by the University Grants Commission for these kind of programs. So uh, these are available in during this pandemic time. The number of uh, downloads are mentioned at the bottom here uh, is in millions now. Those who have seen this, those who have used this, so all those exercises which were done some time back, they were they proved to be beneficial in the pandemic time. So it was like preparation for the future that we were doing at that time, little realizing that we will face pandemic time. So MOOC is like you know four quadrant model which was developed by Center for E-Learning at Khalsa College, uh, and then that, that was accepted um, at the national level uh, by the University Grants Commission. 
so you all are aware so i'm not going to the details of the each of the quadrant so quadrant 1 is about uh, the you know content of that uh, then audio and video content quadrant 2 is about self instructional material ebooks illustrations etc quadrant 3 is about discussion forum and quadrant 4 is about assessment which is very important and we need to apply bloom's taxonomy for that so that you ask basically not only the questions which are in the domain of remember and understand but they are in the domain of apply uh, analyze evaluate and create so that even if it is open book examination the person is able to write answers only when when he has understood those aspects so blended mode of or uh, blended model of education is something which is the order of the day now has been mentioned by the previous speaker also digital classrooms uh, are important uh, hybrid learning environments online uh, driver is uh, entirely self directed and takes place in a digital environment learners engage with an instructor through chat email message board that is Uh, part of the hybrid role of teacher in the blended learning traditionally classroom instruction has largely been teacher directed top down one size fits all and blended learning more student driven uh, bottom up customization is the new new normal now new model so role, role of learner in blended learning is also changed you have to be more active participants in your own development process as a learner Uh, LMS we have implemented SSU LMS dot in now I have myself conducted and uh, it is running mind management program there you know it's a course four credit course uh, happiness and fulfillment so we are now converting our uh, courses on LMS and uh, these are some of the you know screenshots you can see from other aspects as well. uh i'm not going into the details of all this learning management system identifies people who need a particular course and tells them how it fits into their academic career when it's available how it is available and so on once the learners complete a course lms can administer test based on proficiency requirements report the test results and recommend next steps so i'm skipping these there are many uh, open source lms platforms which are mentioned here i'm not naming all of them and there are uh, commercial which means paid uh, also which are on the right hand side so if you are interested you can go through that ipsit is a model identify resources and learners centered activities provide resources and announce activities on lms scaffolding and support to learners identification of learning gaps and feedback and testing this is ipsit model which has been mentioned in the uh, white paper uh, published by the university grants commission also so lms erp is something which is important bandwidth is to be taken care of uh, if you really want to have good experience of these things so right from admission to placement an engagement with all the other people all the technology has to play a role in that electronic devices have to play a role in that data center services are important smart classrooms are important so the in the entire journey the entire ecosystem of the teaching learning process of a university we need to make sure that technology is embedded into that like uh, i i came i come from university of delhi uh, i am leave from university of delhi to shri shri university there we have lakhs of students so admission itself without technology it creates so much of pain for the students so if they are able to pay online fees online submission of documents you can use uh, the uh, online verification of documents and so on and so forth so the entire admission process can be seamless using the technology teaching learning i have emphasized virtual labs i have been mean, Besides, with the previous speaker, placements nowadays, interviews are happening online. The uh, summer internships are happening online. Engagement with other stakeholders like alumni, industry partners, and all that are happening online. So, technology, if you see, is embedded now in every process, every step 
in the university system. And uh, uh, it's good that uh, we face pandemic uh, during this time that we are actually riding uh, on a on a industry 4.0 from technology point of view that we could uh, leverage this time and education did not lose. Education as a sector was ahead of times. And uh, what uh, was supposed to happen 10 years from now actually is happening right now. Now, So thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts with the August gathering that we have today. 115 participants are there along with uh, the speakers, which I see now. So it's great to be part of all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Parimal Atviyazi, to be with us. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening speech. It gave us an insight into how technology has transformed the education at all the levels and how cultivating human tech literacy resources aids in the present education environment. Thank you, sir. I would now request Professor Kamlesh Vaishnav from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Faculty of Technology and Engineering, to introduce the president of today's session, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Parimal Vyasar. Over to you, Kamlesh sir. Vaishnav sir, you need Vaisnav. to unmute yourself. Vaishnav sir, you need to unmute yourself. Now it's okay. It was not allowing me to unmute. Anyway, thanks, uh, Haitar Madam. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to introduce our own beloved Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Professor Parimal Vyas, the president of today's function. Professor Parimal Vyas is highly contributing to the academics and administration of the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda continuously for the second term as vice chancellor from 11th February 2019. Under his able leadership, the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University has achieved National Assessment and Accreditation Council's reaccreditation of MSU Baroda with A grade, that is with 3.16 CGPA in 2016. He has the distinction of being the very first joint professor of Faculty of Management Studies. His research impact include 130 research papers and articles, nine books, and 103 presentations at various national and international conferences and workshops. He has been honored with awards of best research paper 11 times. He has completed six major research projects of UGC and guided more than 17 PhD and MPhil scholars. He has been recognized as member of editorial board of the referred journals in more than 26 national and international journals. He has been nominated as chairperson in the various committees constituted by University Grant Commission and National Assessment and Accreditation Council. He is also a distinguished member of National Board of Accreditation. He has also been nominated as eminent member in the Board of Management at Delhi Technological University, New Delhi. Under his visionary leadership, university initiated and enhanced several educational technology projects like digital university, Wi-Fi campus, online admission, online examination, recruitment, human resource management system, annual report management system, Moodle LMS, MSC information system, CCTV, smart classes, etc., to name a few. The university is striving for achieving higher standards in academics and administration under his patronage. May I now request Professor Parimal Vyasar to bestow his presidential remark to enlighten the audience. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Kamles. Am I audible to you? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Oh, oh thanks a lot. Uh, so it was. Uh, a great treat for uh, the Maharaja Sahaji Rao University of Baroda. And uh, uh, it was it was uh, really a great pleasure to listen to 
Professor Narona from IIT Mumbai. I think uh, today we have both both the speakers. You know, they have tried to you know provide us uh, you know two important uh, dimensions of uh, whether we call it virtual education, online education, or e-education, and uh, it reinforced many of our experiences. Uh, Professor Ajay Kumar Singh, in particular, I know because. I, I know him for more than now uh, two decades, and then um, maybe uh, he very appropriately, you know, shared his experience of you know preparing, taking education to the next level. Where we are today to talking about education 5.0, but uh, the experiments at the national level and his contribution, I know, and it was it was it was a pleasant uh, you know uh, to listen to him. It was a great pleasure because. Maybe in such a spot, short span of maybe about 20, 25 minutes, uh, he has provided us complete canvas of uh, what is technology, what is education, and then, uh, you know, taking the contemporary issues and then the futuristic approach, which is very, very important. Professor Kamlesh, uh, in fact, uh, as you all know, we are celebrating this one year of national education policy and uh, uh, as directed by the Minister of Education today, uh, at the national level, we are celebrating, uh, you know, our discussion, understanding, and deliberations on the theme of use of technology in education. Uh, maybe uh, we should not get confused, and we should not relate technology only with the technical things. That's what my understanding is about technology. I believe technology, as I've said several times, it is an abstract concept. I, technology is, I think, uh, is way of life. Let us realize that we cannot imagine even a nanosecond without technology. And technology is not just machines. Technology is not just procedural compliances. I think uh, technology has changed the way we live. Technology has changed the way we think. And uh, as a professor of management or as a student of management, I would say that uh, if we look at our current lifestyle, right from morning, we come up with a bed. And I, I think uh, if we are talking about collaborations which are becoming important, I think connectivity or inter interactivity now is becoming very, very important. And uh, everything is becoming virtual, uh, you know, and uh, one can talk about the, you know, whole range of uh, recent developments that we, are, we all are experiencing. It has killed, in fact, there's a paradigm shift transformation that has come, uh, you know, in the life of, most of us on this earth and uh, uh, it was mounted LCD projector and reading out uh, the LC, what we call the PowerPoint presentation that was probably the concept of uh, online education but we never realized that COVID you know in fact compelled all of I, as far as I understand, more than 400 universities of a they, in fact, we are managing uh, everything virtually. Kamlesh has just outlined, but I can, I'm very happy to share with you that uh, the Maharaja of University of started online admissions 2012 and probably. You talk about student nominations right from start showing an interest in the convocation, virtual convocation with the auspicious presence of Kamlesh Vyasji, uh, who is a part of Silicon Valley and alumnus of the Maharaja SB, which were used. And uh, yes, uh, we always take pride because when United States of America said, oh, we would not give you computer, then an alumnus of MSU Baroda once again, Vijay uh, Bhatkarji, the man who developed so campus. So when I talk about the use of technology in education, The national education policy talks the deep uh, rooted in 
and i'm very happy to share with you the word the faculty of technology but it's if you look if you go to its origin it was known as kala bhavan now in fact uh, when we talk about use of technology in education the challenge before all of us is to you know integrate have a seamless integration uh, in the uh, in, in order to benefit the human uh, beings or mankind it is the seamless integration of what we call it uh, is a gnan and vigyan because we talk about 21st century is the knowledge century and i think gnan is also important which you call it knowledge and vigyan science is also very very important and we should not forget that we all believe we all cherish a philosophy of vasudev kutumbakam i think it is great uh, you know to uh, conclude the series of webinars that we are going to have uh, we started on 29th of july with the blessings of our honorable prime minister sri narendra bhai modi ji there was a nation wide uh, address on 29th and from 30th we started celebrating a uh, one year national education policy i am very happy to share with all those who are with me in this webinar uh, and they have joined across the country that the maharaja sahajir of university of baroda be it academic banks of credit be it multiple entry and exit or be it internationalization of higher education we are you know we are ready with our revised ordinances and new ordinances and we are implementing it from this academic year 2021 2022 today only we had a marathon meeting and we are placing this for consideration of postgraduate council of studies and research and it would be implemented from this very year the national education policy which talks about multi educational research university we are blessed and we owe it to sir sajid rao gaikwad be it faculty of family and community science faculty of fine arts performing arts faculty of law education and psychology or i talk about faculty of management studies and social work this is a very strong blend of faculties in humanities and social sciences and we have a very strong faculty of faculty of science and faculty of technology and engineering the university is in fact a perfect example of meru and the h index of our university is 96 and uh, probably um, um, if i give the account of last 5 years maybe more than 373 projects which runs into several crores out of 100 plus departments about 30 departments they are supported by the funding agencies so one can talk extensively but let us realize the take away which i think all of us should remember for today's webinar is that we can't think of life without technology and not just technology it is not that what we do manually it would be done with machines no we need to be very smart we need to be very agile we need to be very very creative and above all innovative to see to it that how can we become student centric and uh, the um, maharaja sahajir of university of baroda with his msuis which is again is a brain child of our computer center which is hosting today's webinar now it, be it recruitment portal of uh, teachers or be it recruitment portal of non teaching staff be it the admissions and the examinations or be it accounts audit you name the application i think uh, i give my full compliments and greetings to the team of computer center we all have done it developed it indigenously without hiring any agency you know i think that is something which is commendable a state university has developed an indigenous examination portal market value is more than 5 crore rupees this is something which is unbelievable unheard of but then the secret of this is that we have built in expertise in our own university and i think uh, uh, if we integrate the capabilities competencies expertise knowledge skills abilities and above all fine tune the attitudes by creating a team i think technology can certainly help us to realize the vision and mission of the university it was a great treat to listen to uh, uh, professor norana because msu has also developed virtual lab and i want it is just in a infancy stage beat moodles that or lms that professor singh was talking about i think we really need to uh you know address one issue what is that we need to change the mindsets of be it class 4 class 3 class 2 admin staff or be it assistant professor to vice chancellor we need to change mindsets and we can change the mindsets and that can happen with 
proper orientation training once we can change the mindset make people understand that this use of technology is not against them but it is to create leisure to create leisure time to instantaneously re re reply so and satisfy our students and our colleagues and we can generate whatever kind of report customization which we talk in business i think now the competitiveness has come to that extent that we really need to customize if we have to sense we have to serve and we have to satisfy if this three s if you want to deliver i think we all need to harness uh, you know smart use of technology intelligent use of technology and uh, i i think uh, beat our curriculum design and development beat our research uh, collaborations or beat our you know efforts to you know preserve and sustain the environment sdg4 which you are talking about i think technology uh, is going to uh, you know play a big role and today it was an opportunity for all of us to listen to two stalwarts and both of them presented a very nice interesting blend uh, you know of uh, presentation with two different perspective i think there will be lot of take away and i am really satisfied with the webin series of webinars that we are conducted i think uh, um, uh, today i am sure there will be lot of takeaways on behalf of the university i appreciate uh, the presence of all of you and uh, all those who are here with me and with the team of msu baroda i would request including uh, professor norona and professor ajay kumar singh ji that we have invited today our own beloved uh, you know uh, friend philosopher and guide from nek bengaluru uh, dr devendra kavde ji i i'm sure he uh, was to join at 4:15 we would not keep him waiting dr chakravarti ji if you are there we would continue and i would request all of you you know please uh, stay with us we would switch over to the a validatory mode of these webinars which we started celebrating from 29th of you know july 2021 over to you dr chakravarti and thank you thank you one and all for a very present patient listening namaskar thank you sir well uh, i have been uh, assigned this uh, pleasant duty of proposing the vote of thanks for this uh, webinar on the use of technology and uh, then immediately we will switch over to the valedictory function uh, i'll take this opportunity to thank uh, professor ak singh vice chancellor sri sri university odisha for uh, sir thank you so much for having accepted our invitation and we look forward to further association with you sir uh, for the benefit of our of our students and teachers thank you indeed sir for sparing your time i'm thankful to dr santosh naronha uh, department of uh, chemical engineering iit bombay and the coordinator of virtual labs and healthcare consortium iit bombay so thanks indeed to you and uh, we again look forward we have to begin our efforts towards the virtual labs and uh, as you know dr nitin bhate is looking after it uh, uh, i'm sure we will go forward with this and uh, this particular endeavor will uh, bear fruits for the university in the future i'm sure about that i assure you of our complete uh, dedication for the cause and certainly we look forward to your uh, further association for the benefit of our students and teachers uh, thank you sir thank you uh, dr narona uh, on this occasion i would also thank uh, professor parimal vyas our honorable vice chancellor won't say much about him but uh, he has been the guiding force and the inspiration for all these things uh, i'll talk more when i go for the valedictory function uh, i'll talk more about him because uh, uh, i think any words for him will be less right now uh, a compliment a uh, word of compliment for uh, team computer center and the computer science department uh, professor apurva shah professor kamlesh vaishnav hetal ji and the entire team uh, my compliments and congratulations to you for having done this in a great way thank you all uh, and uh, also my due thanks uh, to all the participants who have joined the syndicate syndicate and senet members who have joined uh, all the teachers and the students who have joined and with this note i uh, again thanking all i conclude this function 
or conclude this webinar. I would say the series of webinar, you know, over all these 10 days. Uh, and uh, I, I call it a day as far as this webinar is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Continuing with the ongoing flow and uh, beginning the valedictory function. I welcome you all to the valedictory function of uh, this very important event of celebrating one year of NEP 2020 at the MS University of Baroda. We have had a series of webinars right at the inception of uh, the national uh, education policy uh, one year back and also now, uh, of course, it was uh, the mandate of the Ministry of Education as well and the, the government of Gujarat also. Uh, we will beginning. We will begin this function with uh, the university song. I would request everybody to rise for the occasion. Thank you. The chief guest of today's function, Dr. Devendra Kaude, Deputy Advisor, National Assessment and Accreditation Council. Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Maharaja Sahajira University of Paroda, Professor Parimal Vyas. The Registrar of the MS University of Baroda, Dr. K. M. Chudasma. Senate and Syndicate members, coordinators and directors of cells and centers. My teacher colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you. Aap sabhi ko mera namaskar. 
we are inching towards an imp very important milestone. Uh, as you all know, the Ministry of Education had given us the mandate, the mandate to all universities to propagate the awareness regarding the national education policy and prepare the grounds for its implementation. The policy came after 34 years in July 2020. And uh, under the able leadership of our Vice Chancellor, sir, we immediately set out on the first goal of spreading the awareness of uh, the national education policy. The IQAC, the internal quality assurance cell, played an important part in it. And uh, together, we did almost 12 webinars on different aspects of national education policy. It covered almost everything, uh, right from holistic education, interdisciplinary studies, to the structural transformation, uh, which is the first step towards the implementation of the policy. And a galaxy of speakers uh, blessed us on the occasion. Today, we are happy that we have done enough and done effectively for the implementation and awareness of the national education policy. One year on, we were mandated by the Ministry of Education to carry forward this agenda and further cement the ground for the implementation of this policy. As you all know, the notification for academic bank of credits and the lateral transitions has been already issued. The government has moved. It is imperative on us now to act on it. We at the MS University of Baroda would take pride to convey that many things which are there in the national education policy are already existing at this place, at this university. And uh, we need to further maybe restructure a bit to implement this education policy and uh, fine tune it uh, in the MS University of Baroda. To shed light on all this, to celebrate this one year of uh, the implementation of uh, the new education policy, the rollout of this uh, national education policy. We have this, uh, we had this string of webinars over the last 10 days, starting from 30th July. Today is the culmination and uh, to mark the occasion for this valedictory function, we have amongst us, Dr. Devendra Kavde, the deputy advisor of National Assessment and Accreditation Council. Is basically a faculties in the commerce and management uh, field with a teaching experience of 16 years and an administrative experience of seven years. He has been a supervisor for PhD with RTM Nagpur University. He has completed two major research projects. He has produced, published around six books in the subjects of commerce and management. He has several papers and articles published in the national and international journals, newspapers, and magazines. He has delivered lectures as a keynote speaker on in various conferences, seminar, and workshop. Uh, has been here on quite a few occasions, and we have a very cordial relation with him. He has been a guiding force to us as well. He has worked as a director, Department of Management Sciences and Research, DMSR Nagpur. Has also worked as a Joint Secretary, University Grants Commission, New Delhi. And right now, he is the Deputy Advisor at the National Assessment and Accreditation Council, Bengaluru. Sir, uh, we would like to continue this fruitful association. And uh, we expect you to guide us further in all our endeavors. For the occasion, I would request Dr. Devendra Kaude to give, please address the audience. audience. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Namaste to everybody. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Thanks, Chakravarti ji, uh, for your nice introduction. Uh, I would like to share uh, some slides related with, uh, uh, to push something very special uh, in this validatory. Shall I? Yeah, sure, sir. Please.
can you see yes you we can see sir it's a full Clear. screen you can see full screen na no? yeah yeah okay thank you thanks so namaste to everybody again uh, respected dr parimal vyas ji vc of this prestigious institute the way he spoke about the university was really appreciating he was narrating about what has happened just oh, i was able to hear only last 5 minutes when i joined but it's uh, is lots of things are there to speak about so and uh, the way uh, the both the speakers have narrated that also he was speaking it's really appreciable then registrar of this university dr k m chaudha sama ji acha one important thing what i found immediately now is that uh, both the vcs the means the vc of this university and the vc who was as a speaker ajay kumar singh ji my good friend they are all we all are from the commerce frame and <laughs> it's fortunate <laughs> so that's something <laughs> interesting so yeah and chakravarti ji of course you i know you you are a very hard worker and uh, with the, under the leadership of vyas ji you are doing a good job as an iqc coordinator and respected academicians who are listening as a participants here it's my pleasure to speak in this validatory function of uh, one year of transfer transformative reforms under nep and uh, the way Uh, this institution has come out with uh, almost i think so eight uh, different topics on uh, different days of the presentation related with the themes which was being stated or shared by uh, ministry of education so to uh, uh, i ask i requested uh, vyas sir how much time i have to speak he said okay 25 to 30 minutes so half an hour i will be sharing something which is related and which i found very interesting with this university okay because there are so many things uh, which uh, which everybody should know about this university and what extra can be done in addition to what they already have uh, that i want to narrate uh, here so friends uh, nep document in itself is uh, as you know it's impactful interactive innovative and inclusive an interesting part what i found it and i remember one phrase related with that is that if you want to impress someone make it complicated and if you want to help someone then make it simple and this nep document is something like that it is so simple to understand for any layman any person related with the education system uh, we are focusing here on higher education system so can easily understand so simply written and so kudos to the people who have really drafted it now purpose everybody knows uh but something extra i would like to uh, point out here is that uh, because our india is an emerging and developing country edc we call it is in short form and so what uh, there are several aspects related to that we are the seventh richest country we have a uh, second higher education system in the world highest because uh, almost 1043 number of universities are there then 11779 Uh, standalone stand alone institutions are there 42343 so it's total it's a big one it's almost 55165 institutions with uh, catering to around 38.5 millions of students so it's uh, this students population is more than the population of canada and australia if we come together or total it and our population is uh, 65% is i think so less than the age of uh, 35 uh, the median age is almost 29 so these are all plus plus point which has to be which this is assumed to be an asset which should be in cash and that in cashment should be there for the development of our economy and so this nap came into existence after so many years is in 1984 it was uh, previously uh, which was uh, which was evolved and then now uh, with uh, taking into cognizance of all these things that there should be a revolution with this young population which we are having so now talking about this uh, prestigious uni institu university if you talk about this university that uh, msub so this ms university has when i asked the details from vyas sir about it i was surprised to know many of the things and this university also has an asset in its own area in their region 47000 students kisko bolte it's a big number then the teaching staff is almost it's a 1457 so almost establishment of 72 years they have lots of things and achievement because he uh, shared with uh, some brochure uh, about the university 
I just I was noting down the numbers, figures, and was uh, surprised because I think so many of the universities can take the lesson from this university to grow, to groom, to move up. But one very important thing which I uh, came out with when I was writing the points related with that uh, brochure, which uh, uh, which I was going through it and come. Considering the base of this NAP, I felt that when uh, you have the lots of achievement, then responsibility increases. Responsibility increases more. I think so. Then Vyasar can understand. Means he has lots of achievement, uh, and his team has lots of achievement. Then more responsibility comes because the people will be seeking more from them. Then NAP also talks about uh, what you also know that curriculum, credit-based courses and projects. Now here the focus, focus should be on that the students should be provided an information or the courses or the programs which are being taught should be related with one line I will tell you, selfishness to selfless. This concept should be there in a philosophical man manner. So what it, uh, the document also speaks about uh, that uh, there should be an area of community engagement in the syllabus or the programs or uh, what the uh, what the university is designs uh, related with and there should be a focus on that satya dharma shanti prema ahinsa that is lessons in seva means how the student can be beneficial to the community at large there should be the focus on maximum so what it is called as selfishness to selfless okay and then another part is that holistic development overall development many of the uh, lectures have been uh, uh, shared in this last seven eight days where this thing was also being talked about but here msub has uh, something very special because i found that they have so many number of mous also with them uh, mous in case of if we talk about number 107 mous i found then international mous also 38 means this all can be useful for this university or the university or the institution like them or the stakeholders of the institution like for the holistic development of the student from all the angles. So these are the credit table means again, the responsibility increases. Then the fourth one, if we uh, move ahead with it, HEI is to set up all these things, what Chakravarti sir has also stated that uh, uh, they have, they already have what NEB talks about. And the fine tune is, tuning of the things are essential. And it is there, really it is there. It is something very special with this university has. It's a startup incubation center also, they have technology development centers, all these things they have. Something which I would like to add here, that is industry academy linkages because one of the university while sharing their best practices in our series of best practices, one university vice chancellor shared with us that uh, they send their uh, teachers for the training, training in sense to learn uh, from the industry, means practical hands-on training they provide to the teachers in the corporates or in the industry so that such type of courses or the design or the development of syllabus or the programs may be there. Uh, that is called updations, updated syllabus related with the practical approach of what is going on. And this can be adopted by the other institutions, universities, colleges and all that. So that is something which can be added in addition to what is going on at present. And then uh, multiple exit uh, uh, exit options, A, B, C, and all that. This you know, something more which I would like to Meru means multiple multidisciplinary education research universities. It is being talked about. So this MSUB has an opportunity to be a Meru. It can be at least because so much of things are there as an asset. So we can take a step ahead because this Meru will be at par with the IITs and IIMs. So we can be there is the possibility so i felt that it uh, it can be an added advantage then in this case if we talk about uh, something more uh, that msub has an advantage of being a vishwa guru it can be how previously you know our uh, uh, our in ancestry if we find that in our old literature uh, there are so many uh, concepts like uh, Takshashila institution or university, Nalanda, Vikramshila, Vallabhai. So such type of universities, they have its prestige. The same way this MSUB can be, okay. One additional thing I would like to suggest or share with you as uh, related with the drafting of uh, or implementation of NEP. Sorry, implementation of NEP. Yesterday I was going through a newspaper and I found that uh, Karnataka government has uh, is with the first state to implement it. So in the line with that, what is that implementation? One thing, uh, something very special, what I found is uh, that uh, the degree course uh, after 
um, means in the degree course, if the institute, if some student is unable to complete in that case, one first year, if he completes, he may uh, get the certificate of second year, it may get the diploma, third year, he may get the degree, and the fourth year, the honors the degree will be there likewise. So this is something we can take uh, the lessons or we can uh, take some tip from such type of uh, initiative being taken by various government, we can also move ahead. So this will be an advantage for the students who were able, who were unable to continue with their degrees by some or the other reason. So, uh, miss, both the things are related. Being a Vishwa Guru or uh, to become a Vishwa Guru uh, is something very special, which is being talked about in an NAP document. Because we have the good institution universities like IITs and IIMs and in line with this MSUB also. So this can make a, a big difference in the coming future if we think about it. Uh, one important thing uh, which I would like to add here that students should be involved in decision making uh, in all the aspects. Probably probabilities are there with such good institution, universities, even the I think so Sri Sri University is also in line with that uh, part that decision making bodies uh, or involvement of the students in the decision making bodies may make a di big difference in the coming future because uh, the time is less, otherwise I would have shared one very interesting story related with the decision making, why the decision making makes a difference in the career of the student, in the life of the student in the future, uh, as though it uh, matters a lot for uh, the success and the failure of the student's career uh, related with whatsoever the job prospect they may proceed with. So these are uh, the things which matters a lot. Okay, then one more thing you can add it here, sustainable development. Uh, because here uh, the NEP also indirectly focuses on that uh, the institution should uh, take care of its economy, infrastructure system, demography and demand if they move, want to move ahead with the sustainable development. Yeah, in this case, positive infrastructure, it was being talked about. And one line I would like to share with you uh, with very important thing is that uh, a place for everything and everything in its place can make a very positive impact on the on the atmosphere on the environment on the culture uh, of the institution of the university in the teaching learning process and several other aspects i repeat that line a place for everything and everything in this place uh, you can quote several examples related with that and wherever there is a positive vibration in the institution uh, there may be a big difference uh, into the teaching learning process and lots of achievement can be followed with this concept then uh, this promotion system, this promotion system, which is being adopted as per the UGC norms and all that, uh, probably in future, it may be focused on how many, how much of uh, outcome the teachers has come out with in the form of say, uh, of course, past percentage and all that feedback from the students matters a lot related with the teaching learning process. But of course, it should be focused on related with what sort of papers, projects, and some extension activity they are moving ahead with. Uh, in order to retain uh, the position which they are, because teaching job is, seems to be a very noble profession, which has to be encashed by every teacher if they are moving ahead into that direction. Then this equitable access to quality education is being talked about, that is to reach to unreach. And what I found in this uh, with this MS University uh, Baroda is that they are moving ahead very nicely with that e-governance concept. Almost they have taken initiative in 23 areas that is commandable. So uh, very less universities probably might have moved ahead like this, what they are doing it in the uh, e-governance initiative. And this is the need of the hour. So this is something very special, which I found with this prestigious university. Yeah. One more important thing is increase employability potential. Here should focus should be there. Ab employability, it is not related with the, how many number of students are being placed. It is related with the career of the student. You know, one study related with the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, it, uh, it uh, give, keeps a track on unemployment rate all over the country. And it states that uh, unemployment rate is very high at present. It's almost 6.9% means, uh, uh, of course, during Corona, it went to means uh, during pandemic period, uh, lockdown and all that went up to 11%. Uh, now it has decreased, but still it is high considering since independence, it is high. It is like that. 
तो देर शुड बी सर्टन स्टेप्स एंड आई सेड ना रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी इंक्रीज विद अ गुड इंस्टीट्यूशन गुड यूनिवर्सिटीज सो देर शुड बी सर्टन स्टेप्स दैट हाउ दिस करियर ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स कैन बी डेवलप्ड इन अ बेटर मैनर हाउ दे कैन गेट एंगेज आई विल टॉक अबाउट इन अ लेटर स्लाइड इन द लास्ट टेन मिनट्स इट सेल्फ की वॉट अबाउट द स्टूडेंट्स आउटकम इफ यू टॉक अबाउट ओके लेट अस मूव अहेड very fast this vocational education also is being discussed very nicely uh, where i found that uh, uh, msub has a very good uh, say into this with uh, almost 20 i think so 98 departments and having a program of 382 so they also has that vocational education but i said na this vocational education it is being stressed to uh, provide a skill education to the students because we lack seriously in the skill education probably we don't have a skillful workforce if we talk about there is some percentage and the percentage you might be also knowing a pan india percentage this 2.3% of our workforce is skillful if we compare it with the countries like south korea they have a 96% then japan they have 80% germany 75% uk 58 and us 52% so we slightly are behind into that so uh, responsibility increases with the good institution that their workforce what is being coming out in the form of output in uh, of the student should be skillful and here the focus can be in this N- nsqf probably many of you people might be involved into it but this uh, the uh, our government has taken an initiative since 2013 and uh, the institutions uh, are being pro- are providing benefit to the students uh, indirectly through this but vigorously uh, they may move ahead with this concept yeah this agriculture agriculture uh, why i intentionally put this slide is uh, we should have a focus area for your information again uh, the good intellectuals and the academicians like vyasab or um, our uh, vice chancellor uh, shri ajay kumar ji also knows very nicely that indian agriculture has about 14% weightage in the country gdp while the almost 60% of our population is dependent directly or indirectly uh, on this process Uh, but what about the education you will find here in the slide itself it is a comprise approximately 9% of all universities less than 1% of enrollment in higher education so slight encouragement should be there that was the stress behind putting this paragraph or the line in the cnep document that we 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 call ourselves as an agriculture some uh, we call ours uh, self uh, into that bracket Uh, but but what about uh, the education what about the progress into that area so here slight uh, uh, stress should be given into this direction and the student should be motivated and this uh, this sector should be also made a lucrative one means it should provide lots of uh, lots of you can say perks or lots of income so it requires some innovation creativity okay now uh, in this case research foundation i found uh, msub has so many things in their uh, in their in their you can say in their bracket example they have around 323 research projects which uh, which is bringing to them around 134.41 crore it's a big number surprise and uh, in addition to there were several there are several other projects around 107 some small projects which is bringing around 26.75 crores to this university so already it is a rich one and nep also talks much about this through its national research foundation probably they will come out uh, a special cell related with that providing funding to the good institutions who are already moving ahead in order to see that the stakeholders of that institution should come out with some innovation creative which will help our country our economy to move ahead in a right direction and can become a very a developed nation very fast so that can be the base uh some uh, one line i think we you people might be knowing very nicely uh, and that we should all as a again as a responsible person of this system is that growth now and profit later that was the motto of japan for long we should also go with that concept that will help us to grow uh, though it will not immediately help uh, directly but it will help our generation future generation to move ahead very fast to be happy one thing is that this board of governors uh, that you know that uh, is some specific good people or good leaders like again vyasab or uh, ajay kumar ji 
or the good administrative uh, skill holders like chakravarti ji and all that uh, should be in the form of board of governors because they have to provide that idp that institutional development plan uh, and interesting thing again uh, coming to the uh, point of this uh, university msub and i found that uh, in that brochure uh, very less people uh, just generally do all this exercise that is action plan and they have an action plan of short term mid term and long term really heads of short term mid term and long term see thinking discussing is a different thing but when you put it on paper and what when you practically try to make the things possible you definitely gain this is a mantra and i am confident with this action plan this institution will also gain uh with a good good board of governors at is being as it is being suggested in nap and probably they will be able to provide a very nice institutional development plan which will be taken care by this nehra yeah this is different why different because nap has talked about that philosophical parameters on which this accreditation uh, may base on that is basic norms public self disclosure good governance and outcomes we believe from the point of view accreditation already the things are there in our process in our policies we talk about basic now you will find it in criteria number 1 and 2 public disclosure you will find in criteria number 4 that is infrastructure and learning resource and good governance you will find in our governance leadership and management criteria number 6 outcomes you may find in find in our research innovation and extension then student support and progression and last criteria institutional values and best practices so it is already there but slight revamping is essential i will come to the crux of this what i want to share with you and what can make a difference in the future considering the future prospect i am focusing on related with this last one that is outcome because this outcomes matters a lot any of the institutions value only derives derived on the basis of what sort of outcomes are there for that institution see there is a very slight difference between output and outcome say in any institution if there are thousand number of students are there and in the form of output some thousand number of students are clearing that uh, say a degree or coming out with a degree or the post graduation degree from that institution so that is an output but if we talk about outcome what about the career of the student whether they really have build are able to build the career with the help of the education what they have received that is an outcome so outcome matters an outcome of the institution only may bring that goodwill of the institutions to a new heights okay so outcome matters and here are related with a specific specific outcome student outcome teachers outcome and institution outcome overall the whole game is on this part only so what means what sort of see it is related with the focus on evaluation of outcome of the course and the programs example i think so this some draft document i have already shared with many of the vcs and many of the principal vice intention is that this should be provoked very nicely because believe me friends if we are able to combinedly push it strongly there can be a big difference in the economy uh, our economy may be very strong and with all the efforts of the good the people like you can be now the student based outcome slightly it is i will take more 5 minutes and then i will finish it how it is related student based outcome is related i have related with the ahavanya what is this ahavanya and all that you know uh, previously uh, in our uh, in our in our you can so we can call it as in our culture in our you know grants and all that it was being written that just as in kitchen kitchen as an auspicious place kitchen seems to be as an auspicious place in a house similarly and higher education institution is an auspicious place in the society so it has to be treated like that okay it, I, again see it is become the responsibility in the vedic period there were three fires which were often lit by the household members now it is the time that those three fires have to be lit by the stakeholders in hei so what are those three fires number one is student based outcome that is after taking the education from the respective hei what the student is becoming that is the career of the student and how it can be related we will call it as ahavanya ahavanya fires many of you scholars may be much more knowing better than me about this it is kept in the eastern direction to invoke the god so we will call it as a student's outcome then teachers based outcome is considered to be or assumed to be as grihapatya 
so grihapatya fires is related with what sort of uh, contribution the teacher is making or doing for the benefit of the society it can be in the form of the students uh, building their career or they are related with the teaching learning process or it can be also related with several research work they are doing it or the contribution they are providing to the society i we always say that it is a win win situation for everybody when we pro go with the process of nac or for any accreditation process i think so this msub they are moving ahead with several even ranking uh, uh, institutions also i think so they participate in that uh, the ranking framework nirf then times higher education so many things they are doing it's very nice but for the stakeholders of this institution or many other teachers responsibility increases when they move ahead with the motto of uh, bringing a prestige to the institution and they also win into that because when they are writing some paper or project when they are doing something which is related with uh, with their own growth also and it is beneficial for the institution at large so it's a win win situation then institution based outcome we will call it as a dakshin agni fires and how it works you know uh we always say in our uh, many of the sessions i think so you will agree that institution should not be in existence if that institution is not working for the society wo institution ko to astitva bhi nahi hona chahiye jo samaj ke liye kuch na kar raha ho to samaj ke liye kaam karna hai to uske liye what are the extra effort that an institution is taking wherever it is located so what we talk not much but at least to some extent we have uh, talked the, about these things in our matrix in criteria number 7 that is institutional values and best practices so here uh, some workout can be done by the institution for the betterment of the society i think this very prestigious very good and very famous and very old almost 72 years old this uh, msu in ms university has a major role to play and several other stakeholders of this university and the other uh, good academician who are listening this will make a difference in the society by moving ahead with this concept though not immediately but for a long term way there will be and nap also talks into this direction so friends whatsoever we do this is very important whatsoever we do there should be always nation first and if we go with this mantra there will be miracles in our nation so in our economy so in our life so one should we should always remember my request is there that for quality assurance we goes uh, we we have a background of that quality concept so our uh, our uh, end of this talk should be related with that also some five components i will share that is for quality assurance is related with what learners want okay your focus should be on that part second it should be related with what sort of quality learning environment is being provided third what sort of quality content is being taught there fourth process that supports quality related with infrastructure and all that and the fifth again it's very important outcome from the learning environment so respected intellectuals a line a quote and we will end that is if we keep doing what we are doing we will keep getting what we are getting if we want to get the results we have never get before then we have to do the things we have never done before we have never done before so lots of expectations are there with the good institutions like yours and so many thanks for your kind invitation it was my pleasure thank you namaste थैंक यू कावड़े जी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आपको थैंक यू सो मच आई थिंक इट वॉज इट वॉज यू नो डिस्कोर्स विद डिफरेंट परसपेक्टिव गॉट अ लॉट ऑफ हिंट्स इन फैक्ट एज टू हाउ टू गो अड यू नो एजुकेशन इज जस्ट नॉट अबाउट बींग इन लेटर बट इन स्पिरिट एज वेल सो येस वी हैव गॉट द मैसेज थैंक यू एंड वुड लाइक टू वॉक द टॉक इन फ्यूचर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू इंडीड एंड लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू यूर कंटिन्यूस गाइडेंस एंड एसोसिएशन सर uh yes uh, i've been again given this duty of uh, introducing our honorable vice chancellor uh, but i have done it on numerous occasions so i i don't intend to give a very formal introduction of uh, professor parimal vyas today but i would uh, say that uh, yes uh, this is a very pleasant occasion a milestone because uh, today i would uh, look at look at it as a day of culmination of not 14 but 24 different webinars uh, 
14 at the inception and 10 after one year of uh, the, the inception of uh, the national education policy. And uh, all throughout, uh, he has been the guiding force. Uh, and to take my point home, uh, I will just quote one thing that the NEP envisages the higher education institutions to have a 30% rise in the gross enrollment ratio. And if I tell you that, well, uh, the last NAC, we were at 35,000 and this NAC we would be at more than 48,000. I think under his leadership, we have already achieved that 30% milestone. So that gives the hint of uh, what we have, uh, you know, been able to achieve under his guidance. Uh, uh, well, it has been a journey together, not forgetting the fact that uh, NEC is just a few months ahead now, uh, the fourth cycle. And all throughout we have been together. I've seen his passion, uh, his, uh, his uh, passion uh, towards the quality. Uh, he has been a huge guiding force and a huge support for us, in fact, uh, to be very honest. Uh, not taking much of time because uh, we have another function coming up within a few minutes. So I would request uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Parimal Vyas to give the presidential address. Sir, please. I think uh, in continuation uh, with the same group of uh, uh, fellow participants and my beloved colleagues of the university, uh, let me, uh, you know, confess it would, it, it would be a very honest confession that, uh, you know, each one of us need a little uh, but very important uh, push. And that push has come today, uh, you know, from Kavreji. Uh, uh, he has got special, uh, you know, affection and expectation from the Maharaja Sahajira of University of Baroda. And uh, uh, I was very patiently listening. In fact, uh, I wish that... Uh, we all should collectively listen to his address. The time that he has spent, the patient with which uh, he has, uh, you know, prepared the presentation, not just uh, he's expressed, uh, you know, his ideas, but he has jotted down all the points. And then uh, it was a wonderful treat to listen to, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Devendra Kavreji. And uh, uh, on behalf of the university, we appreciate. And uh, uh, as a head of the institution, I assure you that, uh, uh, one thing which uh, probably uh, I can say at this moment is that I always say that uh, we have to become student-centric. That's very, very important. MSU first and always. That is what the uh, we are on a mission mode. And third is that uh, uh, we look at this neck reaccreditation re cycle to, you know, standardize, uh, you know, the processes that we follow. Uh, we, we want to, you know, be it a use of technology that what we are discussing today uh, in the last webinar. But then uh, uh, the, the, I, I, I would go with uh, Dr. Kavreji, you know, in uh, uh, one aspect that the challenge before all of us uh, is to uh, how we would create a kind of an environment that we collaborate, we uh, instill trust and confidence in each one of us, be it our students. The, the challenge that the Maharaja Sahaja of University of Baroda is facing, I'll be very honest, yes, the challenge is that we seriously need to focus on skill education. Let me confess that uh, we really need to also have a, uh, we need to work out our strategy for vocational education because the, we, we need to. Third is that, uh, yes, the university uh, uh, of ours, which follows Satyam Sivam Sundaram, the truthfulness, the godliness, and the beautiful beauty. I, I think value education, though, though it is a part of curriculum, but we really need to focus on uh, value education. So I, I believe the challenge that we have at MS University of Baroda, when we want to realize the fruits of national education policy, we need to balance out it in terms of uh, developing employability skills and nurturing entrepreneurship skills. I think how I would like to put it like this. We do not want to, uh, and we do not expect that each one, each of our students should become entrepreneurs. That's not possible. So some of them, they would, and I think whether they become entrepreneurs or not, but we really need to instill these two important skills. Uh, we want to develop life, life skills in our students. Because I think one of the very important strengths, and I would now call it as a challenge, 
is that the university is known globally because of the academic reputation the legacy the heritage and above all this strong alumni with a proven track record with a significant uh, contribution which they have made and I, i i believe this is a very very important challenge we really need to uh, ensure that we continue with the same momentum we we in fact uh, uh, would uh, uh, contribute uh, in in focusing upon developing these skills in our students so that the future generation who would come they would also take pride for us and they would uh, you know take this university to the next level uh, yes uh, apart from alumni because the world's best world class universities are based in the of the world they are uh, known uh, and for their uh, contribution and the participation of the uh, you know alumni uh another thing which uh, i personally um, uh, have been practicing uh, that yes uh, we uh, at msu um i'd be very honest yes we are student centric we are involving and we are engaging to them last next last neck probably we realize that we really need to strengthen our extension activities and i think i must appreciate the efforts put in by my each and every member of teaching and non teaching staff so probably now i think uh, we are bit we are we are satisfied uh, in terms of extension activities that the university has carried out but another two big challenges i think that the university would be confronting while making uh, um, uh, while preparing the plan for implementation of national education policy i think we need to you know, say because in academics if we talk about continuous evaluation i i believe for teaching and non teaching staff i i, I believe we need to have, provide continuous uh, training uh, to have a seamless integration and use of technology that that is one challenge that we are facing with the blessings of god we have a completely wifi enabled campus we draw students from almost all states there's hardly a state from where we are not getting students this this year i'm very happy to share with you that our number of international students which were in two digit probably this year we are we have we have topped the list in terms of attracting international students in the entire gujarat state from 38 countries so that uh, academic diversity that like we enjoy academic flexibility but that is also very very important we get one we get about 600 to 700 students from northeast i think that that's a huge contribution and we want to really uh, strengthen uh, further the number of students that we get from the northeast and i i i i would say that uh, uh, um, not just as a mandatory mandatory requirement of nep but the university is now uh, the uh, today when we are in the valedictory address uh, we are now working and we would be preparing and we would be presenting it, it to government of gujarat what i would call it as um, msu baroda nec uh, uh, i'm sorry msu baroda this nep implementation uh, road map with action plan i think we are working on it already when we started these web series of webinars uh, it was mutually agreed upon and discussed that uh, uh, they would be making contribution we are interacting with all other stakeholders and uh, i believe as a uh, kavade ji very correctly said that we are the trustees of these resources which sir sajid rao gai code is given we have to become self reliant on one end to create resources to see to it that we provide all kinds of uh, you know faculty members the need not depending just on government state or central government but become self reliant and then see to it that uh, with a national uh, you know perspective with a global outlook what our prime minister say in a true sense we need to go for globalization i think uh, that is one and uh, i think uh, um, i want that the maharaja sajira municipal of baroda should become a place yes this is the place which can make difference to their lives and the generations to follow i think uh, the feedback or reflection but it was truly truly uh, you know thought provoking um, rewarding motivating and inspiring address that we all had we wish that we would listen to kavadeji's address which you recorded again and again because i think in maybe 25 30 minutes all those thought processes with a wealth of experience 
with a macro understanding of so many universities across the country i think he has prepared uh, and he has shared his experiences with a kind of a landscape that he has prepared i think uh, on behalf of the university i express deep sense of gratitude to uh, dr devendra kavde ji and uh, professor ajay kumar singh ji and rohana ji and all my beloved colleagues you know where i think uh, you have for last about 11 days you all are with us uh, you are sharing uh, you are spending your afternoon with us and i think it is the team that we have to create the real challenges that we need to create build and sustain that team uh, to make difference in the lives of students who come with lot of their dream you know to shape their career i think it is men in making and i think uh, find on the face of students i think uh, that is something which you cannot get in any other sector so probably uh, uh, with the philosophy that our country follows and the philosophy that the msc follow satyam shivam sundaram i think uh, uh, i as the head of the institution place on record the support my greetings to dr chakravarti and entire team of iqac my team of deans uh, of the various faculties principals heads of the department senate and syndicate members and my beloved students i think uh, you are the source of energy your faith in us makes us to keep on working and as we say the show must go on and i think uh, collectively to you know we would put uh, msu uh, maybe on a global map as desired by dr devendra kavde ji and uh, i would request each and every one of you that please feel free to uh, stay connected give your valuable views give your input i think that only can uh, you know help us to improve because in enhancing of our education is a, i think uh, uh, let us focus on outcome based education that is very very important anything and everything that we do we take we take responsibility for that and we we try to deliver to the best of our abilities competence knowledge and expertise i think uh, that would be a tribute to sir sajirao gaikwad with this not i would like to sign off thank you very much and over to you dr chakravarti thank you thank you very much to one and all thank you sir uh, thank you for this uh, reassuring words your inspirational address uh, may i now request uh, the registrar of the university dr k m chudasma to kindly propose the vote of thanks <laughs> yeah good evening one and all uh, my internet is very patchy so uh, video would not be possible uh, at this outset i would like to acknowledge and thank the kind presence and gracious inputs of uh, devendra gavde ji uh, the road map which he has designed with the keen inputs of how to implement it is really going to be useful to us on behalf of uh, the entire family of maharaja sayajira university of baroda senate syndicate members on behalf of myself and, and honorable vice chancellor sir as well as the staff and students uh, i would like to wholeheartedly thank him for his gracious presence at the uh, validatory event of this uh, long uh, sessions brainstorming sessions of uh, nep uh, indeed his presence is uh, very fruitful to us but the kind of inputs which he has been providing not only during the workshops and seminars or during the webinars but apart from that the design the structure the documentation which he has provided throughout the journey uh, is going to be valuable for us at this outset on behalf of each and every family i acknowledge his presence and his gracious contribution to the maharaja sayajira university of baroda in building us up the knowledge as well as being helpful in guiding us that how to go ahead for getting a good grade in nec thank you so much one and all thanks uh thank you all and uh, let us end this uh, program with the national anthem may i request everybody to rise for the occasion
जनगण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जनगण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय जय हे वेल थैंक यू थैंक यू कावड़े जी प्रोफेसर ए के सिंह बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद नरोना जी बहुत बहुत आपको धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच थैंक्स एवरीबडी हु हैज ज्वाइंड आई वी कॉल इट अ डे थैंक यू सो मच नमस्ते Thank you.